But first, we turn to Ali for a detailed look at a sensationalist New York Times article, which has given new life to Israel's propaganda campaign, campaign asserting, without any credible evidence, that Hamas systematically used rape as a weapon of war during its military assault on Israeli army bases and settlements across the boundary from Gaza. Ali, let's turn to you. And, and just a warning to our viewers and listeners that we'll be discussing uh, sexual violence, including graphic descriptions of the alleged acts. Ali, you're going to give us an update now on the story that we've covered before. Uh, Israel's claims that Hamas fighters systematically carried out rapes as a weapon of war on October 7th. Uh, give us a sense of what's going on now. Yes, thanks, Nora. As you'll remember, we examined these claims in detail during our, our live stream on December 4th, and then we cut that into a separate video that has been viewed almost 200,000 times on YouTube. And I think we showed pretty conclusively that Israel had presented absolutely no credible evidence to support these inflammatory assertions, and that this was a propaganda campaign to demonize Palestinians as monsters to try to erode support for them and to distract from or justify Israel's genocide in Gaza. In other words, toxic war propaganda. We'll add a link to that video uh, below because a lot of the analysis we did then also applies to what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Um, so what's new in this story, Ali? You know, hasn't Israel uh, come up with some, uh, has Israel come up with some solid evidence, you know, that wasn't available before? What is what is this new evidence, supposedly? The short answer is a resounding no. But on December 28th, the New York Times published a big story that has revived the rape claims. It's a sensational story headlined, Screams Without Words how Hamas weaponized sexual violence on October 7th. The lead author is Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter Jeffrey Gettleman, which I suppose gives the story uh, extra weight. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, what, what do you think was the intended effect uh, and what it has been the effect so far of this story? Well, I can tell you personally, I've had a couple of people say to me, you know, Ali, I watched your video from a few weeks ago, but surely now after this big New York Times investigation, you must acknowledge that the evidence is mounting, that there was systematic sexual violence perpetrated by Hamas on October 7th. Right. Uh, and do you agree with that? Does this New York Times piece really change the picture? Well, again, the short answer is absolutely not. This is still a genocidal propaganda campaign, not based on any credible evidence, and I, I hope to show that today. Here's what Speak Up, a feminist initiative made up of more than a dozen women's and human rights groups in the Middle East region, has said in reaction to the New York Times report. They say, this report, allegedly detailing the events and claiming to verify incidents of rape, spans over 3,500 words. However, it fails to present any concrete evidence or include accounts from the alleged victims. They also say, and I quote, as Middle East and North Africa human rights organizations and feminist groups dedicated to supporting victims of gender-based violence and striving to eradicate sexual violence in all its forms, we recognize the possibility of sexual violence occurring in times of war and conflict. Despite this, we find the New York Times report profoundly disturbing for its lack of credible arguments, evidence, and failure to engage with any of the alleged victims. We vehemently oppose the exploitation of women's bodies and experiences in perpetuating misleading propaganda. I think that's a pretty fair assessment. Yeah. So, okay, take us through some of what's in the New York Times article and why you and many others, including Speak Up, um, have concluded that it doesn't contain you know, any new or credible evidence. Okay, so let's begin at the beginning. And again, I just want to warn people that I'm going to be reading very graphic descriptions of alleged acts of sexual violence contained in the New York Times and other sources. So please do be aware of that. The New York Times opens its story with these very emotive sentences, which I'll read. 
at first, she was known simply as the woman in the black dress. In a grainy video, you can see her lying on her back, dress torn, legs spread, vagina exposed. Her face is burned beyond recognition, and her right hand covers her eyes. The video was shot in the early hours of October 8 by a woman searching for a missing friend at the site of the rave in southern Israel where the day before Hamas terrorists massacred hundreds of young Israelis. The video went viral with thousands of people responding, desperate to know if the woman in the black dress was their missing friend, sister, or daughter. One family knew exactly who she was, Gal Abdush, mother of two from a working class town in central Israel who disappeared from the rave that night with her husband. And then the New York Times goes on to imply that Gal Abdush was raped. The Times states, and I quote, based largely on the video evidence, which was verified by the New York Times, Israeli police officials say said they believed that Miss Abdush was raped, end quote. Now, there's a lot going on here. First, the Times says that they verified the video. What does that mean? It means only that the video is really of Gal Abdush, but absolutely nowhere does the New York Times claim that the video shows Abdush being raped. They then state, and I quote, Israeli officials say that everywhere Hamas terrorists struck, the rave, the military bases along the Gaza border, and the kibbutzim, they brutalized women, end quote. In other words, this is an accusation from the Israeli state. It is not evidence. And then directly after this, the New York Times claims that Times claims that Gal Abdush has, quote, become a symbol of the horrors visited upon Israeli women and girls during the October 7 attacks. So that's the setup from the New York Times. Here is this poor woman who was raped, and she's just one of countless women and girls who suffered the same horrible fate. But already, even this thin innuendo about Gal Abdush is falling apart. How is it falling apart? Well, on January 2nd, Gal Abdush's sister, Miral Alta, came out and denied and denounced the New York Times' insinuations that Gal was raped on October 7th. Alta responded to a post on Instagram by Israeli propagandist Joseph Haddad who was playing up the New York Times report claiming that there were mass rapes. Here's some excerpts of what Miral Alta wrote in her rather long comment, which we have translated from Hebrew. She starts by saying, so the lady in the black dress is my sister. I really don't understand all the media reports about this story. Why do I say this? Because there were so many horrible stories, even more horrible. So why especially her story? It's all because of one video that was distributed without the family's knowledge, without permission. And then Miral Alta says, and I quote, yes, they raped. Yes, they slaughtered, cut off heads and body parts. But in the case of my sister, no. Why not? At 6.51, Gal sends us a message to the WhatsApp group. We are on the border. You don't understand what's going on. Such explosions, we are out of here. At seven o'clock, my brother in law calls his brother and says, They shot Gal, she is gurgling. So, how in four minutes did they rape, slaughter, and burn her? End quote. So, note here that Miral Alta is repeating the widespread claims that there were rapes and torture, which she, like all Israeli, Israelis, has been fed by the government and media. But she specifically and categorically denies that the family believes this happened to her sister, Gal Abdush. And she points out that from their perspective, this story is totally implausible. Miral Alta also states, quote, there is no medical evidence or test proving she, Gal, was raped. (laughs) Um, I I mean, you know, putting journalist malpractice aside, uh, why didn't she say this to New York Times reporters? Why, why do you think that the reporters have uh, went with this as their kind of focus of the story? And and why do you think Mural Alter is saying this now? 
Well, that's the amazing thing. According to Miral Alter, the family never even knew that the New York Times was writing about the alleged rape campaign or was going to allege that Gal Abdush was raped. She indicates that the family was manipulated by the New York Times. And she says, quote, note, the New York Times came to us saying they wanted to write an article memorializing Gal and Naji, and that's it. That's why we consented. We would never agree. Naji was Gal Abdush's husband who was also killed that day. And finally, Miral Alta addresses Joseph Haddad, the pro-Israel social media influencer who made the Instagram post promoting the New York Times story, and, and it's to his post she was responding. Alta says, Joseph, you do great work. If only there were more like you. Please, there is no proof there was rape. It's only based on the video. And if there is any other proof, of course, we would want to know. Uh, Ali, can we be sure that this comment is authentic and that it is really from Gal Abdush's sister? I'm very confident we can, yes. Miral Alta, the author of the comment in question, has locked her Instagram account. However, there is an unlocked Facebook account with the same name, Miral Alta, but in Hebrew. And that account has the same avatar as the Instagram account, which is a map of the country and the Israeli flag. And scrolling through Alta's Facebook feed reveals she is, in fact, Gal Abdush's sister. For example, on October 7th, she pleads for help to find Gal and Gal's husband, Naji. On October 16th, she posted Gal's death notice and calls Gal my sister. And then on October 23rd, she posted a video of the funeral of Gal and Naji. Incidentally, uh, Miral Alta's Facebook page reveals that her politics are very far right in Israeli terms. This is not someone who sympathizes with Palestinians in uh, any way. Mm -hmm. I just want to also acknowledge here the assistance of uh, investigative journalist David Sheen with translation and verification. Thank you, David. Yeah, thanks, David. Okay, so this uh, is a, a pretty whole scale you know, discrediting of the New York Times story. Um, you know, we could stop right here and just, you know, for once and for all be done with it. But uh, but I'm assuming you have more. <laughs> well, there's a lot more. And yeah. But rather than go through the New York Times story line by line, I want to cover a couple of key themes which help us understand this sophisticated piece of war propaganda and how it's constructed. Yeah. And I think will also be tools for people to start to deconstruct other uh, pieces of war propaganda. So I, the questions I ask in analyzing this, are: what are the accusations? Who are the supposed witnesses? What is the alleged evidence? And who are the alleged victims? Great, okay, so uh, let's start. What, what are the accusations? The thing I want people to remember is that from the start, Israel has not been alleging that there might have been one or two incidents of sexual assault on October 7th, but that this was a systematic practice on a vast scale. Here's what the New York Times claims. A two-month investigation by the Times uncovered painful new details establishing that the attacks against women were not isolated events, but part of a broader pattern of gender-based violence on October 7th. Relying on video footage, photographs, GPS data from mobile phones, and interviews with more than 150 people, including witnesses, medical personnel, soldiers, and rape counselors, the Times identified at least seven locations where Israeli women and girls appear to have been sexually assaulted or mutilated. End quote. A couple of things to note here. First, they claim there was a, a broad pattern or broader pattern. And then they suggest there's lots of evidence, including video footage. It all looks very solid to the casual reader, doesn't it? Right. But you, you, you would think from the, their big, bold claims that there would be tons of evidence. However, as we'll see, there isn't. The New York Times does not claim, and nor has anyone else claimed, that there is a single video out of the tens of thousands filmed on October 7th that in which a sexual assault can be seen taking place. That is a really inexplicable absence if this was indeed a deliberate and broad campaign of sexual violence, as Israel and the New York Times 
allege. The evidence should simply be everywhere. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what about the witnesses? Um, the New York Times says that they interviewed dozens of people um, and it's the New York Times, you know, a credible uh, outlet. Surely, you know, that, that should amount for something. Right. They say more than 150 people, including witnesses, medical personnel, soldiers, and rape counselors. Let's start with the supposed eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. The Times states, and I quote, Sapir, a 24-year-old accountant, has become one of the Israeli police's key witnesses. She does not want to be fully identified, saying she would be hounded for the rest of her life if her last name were revealed, end quote. Sapir spoke to the New York Times, and she claims to have seen heavily armed gunmen rape and kill at least five women. Sapir said she herself had been shot and was feeling faint and lying in the bushes when she saw what happened. Again, a warning that this is very graphic. Here's how the Times describes Sapir's claim, and I'm quoting. The first victim said she, was, she saw a young woman with copper color hair let me start that again. The first victim she said she saw was a young woman with copper-colored hair, blood running down her back, pants pushed down to her knees. One man pulled her by the hair and made her bend over. Another penetrated her, Sapir said. And every time she flinched, he plunged a knife into her back. She said she then watched another woman shredded into pieces. While one terrorist raped her, she said another pulled out a box cutter and sliced off her breast. Her breast. One continues to rape her, and the other throws her breast to someone else, and they play with it, throw it, and it falls on the road, Sapir said. She said the men sliced her face, and then the woman fell out of view. Around the same time, she said, she saw three other women raped, and terrorists carrying the severed heads of three more women, end quote. Now, that, of course, sounds pretty horrifying and dramatic. The first thing to say here is that, is that this is not a new supposed eyewitness. This is the same person whose testimony Israeli police presented at the press conference back in November and who we discussed in our de December 4th video as well. As we pointed out then, most of the other Western media that previously reported her account, and that includes CNN and the Washington Post, failed to mention her claim that Hamas men were dancing around with severed heads. And that's because this outlandish claim that has never been corroborated totally discredits her as a witness. As reported by Hebrew language media in mid-November, this same witness had previously claimed, quote, I saw one of them carrying a naked girl on his shoulder while the others were raising decapitated heads like in a kind of demonstration of power, end quote. Now, the New York Times, as I read, does make a passing mention of Sapir claiming that she, quote, saw terrorists carrying the severed heads of three more women. But the Times does not follow up on this extraordinary claim in any way, nor do they quote any Israeli official source claiming that multiple severed heads or headless bodies were located at this specific site. Speak Up, the coalition of women's and human rights groups that I mentioned earlier, notes that the horrific acts that Sapir describes would, quote, typically leave substantial physical evidence, yet the narrative does not mention any supporting forensic or physical proof to validate these events, not even the bodies. Speak Up also notes that Israeli police chose not to collect any forensic evidence from this and other locations, which would have been very feasible given the bloody scenarios described in order to fact check and confirm the testimony of uh, the alleged eyewitnesses. And they also observe in relation to Sapir's claims that her testimony comes from an individual who describes being shot and feeling faint, which could impair their ability to perceive and recall events accurately. accurately. They say physical trauma or distress can significantly affect memory and perception. Yet this individual provides a detailed fiction-like account that appears to have undergone no fact-checking and is suspiciously identical to wartime atrocity propaganda. Yeah. 
Um, and according to the New York Times, Sapir wasn't the only witness to this key incident. Uh, is that right? That's right. The New York Times names another alleged eyewitness to this same incident called Yura Carroll, uh, and it describes him as a 22-year-old security consultant. He was hiding in the same location as Sapir, but the same witness, and again, he's the only other alleged eyewitness to this incident, appears to have changed his story. Here's what the New York Times says, quote, in an interview, Mr. Carroll said he barely lifted his head to look at the road, but he also described seeing a woman raped and killed, end quote. Now, the first thing to note here is that he claims he barely lifted his head, and yet he somehow saw all this going on. He also doesn't say anything about Hamas men prancing around with a bunch of severed heads, something I suspect would be very hard to miss if it actually happened. But what he's telling the New York Times is completely different to what he was previously reported as saying. Here's how the Israeli newspaper Haaretz reported his account on November 8th about the horrifying rape, murder, and dancing around with severed heads that Sapir claims to have seen. And I quote now from Haaretz, and this was back uh, in November. Another witness who has recounted the incident to police was a man who was hiding behind the eyewitness and didn't see the rape. He said she told him at the time what she saw, end quote. So this second eyewitness, now being cited by the New York Times, said way back in early November that he did not see the rape, but only that Sapir told him about it. And yet now he's repeating it to the New York Times as if he saw it himself. So apparently the New York Times did not even take the basic journalistic step of checking whether the claims of this supposed eyewitness have remained consistent over time. Yeah. Uh, what about any other reports uh, on any other eyewitness accounts in this New York Times story? Yeah. The New York Times claims there was one other incident of rape in a different location and that there were two eyewitnesses for that incident. The first eyewitness is someone called Raz Cohen, who, mm -hmm. whom the New York Times identifies as having worked recently in the Democratic Republic of Congo training Congolese soldiers. That sounds very wholesome. Yeah. <laughs> according to right, according to his account, he was, quote, hiding in a dried up stream bed, end quote. About 40 meters away, he claims he saw a white van pull up. And now I'll read again from the New York Times. He said he then saw five men wearing civilian clothes, all carrying knives, and one carrying a hammer, dragging a woman across the ground. She was young, naked, and screaming. They all gather around her, Mr. Cohen said. She's standing up. They start raping her. I saw the men standing in a half circle around her. One penetrates her. She screams. I still remember her voice. Screams without words. End quote. And that's where the, the dramatic title to this whole article comes from. Again, the New York Times does not speak of any corroborating physical evidence and forensic evidence, such as blood on the ground or a body. It's just Raz Cohen's account, and that account also appears to have changed over time, as the journalist Max Blumenthal has documented. Right after October 7th, Cohen didn't report seeing any rapes, but over time he started claiming he did, and those claims are inconsistent with each other. Let's take uh, one glaring example in the Times Cohen claims to have seen just one woman being murdered and raped. But in an interview with the PBS NewsHour on October 10th, Raz Cohen gave a very different account. Let's uh, take a look at that. I see a terrorist and they told everyone to, to run away. And uh, that's what we did. The terrorist uh, shoot, on, shoot on us. And, uh, I, and I saw a lot of people uh, died in my eyes, I, I uh, murdered in my eyes. Uh, people get shot in the head, in the shoulder. A lot of b dead bodies, uh, we go to hide in a bush, a big bush uh, in, the, in, in the creek. 
and uh, we was uh, in, the, in the bush uh, something like six or seven hours. A lot of uh, uh, terrorists uh, go around us and search uh, searched for, uh, for people to kill, the terrorists. Uh, people from uh, Gaza raped uh, 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 girls and uh, after they raped them, they uh, uh, killed them and uh, murdered them with knives or, uh, or the opposite kill and after this rape they, they did that they laugh they always laugh it's i can't uh, can't forget how they left on on the yeah so as you can see cohen there seems to be talking about a number of rapes uh but in the new york times it's only one um uh, yeah and so the and then uh Max uh, Blumenthal has pointed to a number of inconsistencies over time in Raz Cohen's stories in that he's he appears at the beginning right after October 7th, then he disappears for a while, and then he comes back into the media right at the point where Israel relaunched this uh, propaganda campaign about mass rapes uh, back in uh, the end of November, early December, around the time we talked about it on the live stream last time. Right. And uh, the Times claims that there is a second witness to this uh, alleged incident, too. Is that right? Yeah. The Times states, and I quote, Shoam Geta, one of Mr. Cohen's friends and a fashion designer, said the two were hiding together in the stream bed. He said he saw at least four men step out of the van and attack the woman who ended up between their legs. He said that they were talking, giggling, and shouting, and that one of them stabbed her with a knife repeatedly, literally butchering her. And, I mean, obviously this is very convincing, right? Don't you find this convincing? Well, I mean, the thing to notice here is that the Times does not even quote Geta specifically saying the woman was raped, although he does claim to have seen what, by any account, would be a, a brutal attack. However, this is not the first time that Goethe has spoken out. Mm. He's quoted in an NBC news report on October 8, which claims he watched as a woman was cut with a knife. But there's no mention then of any rape. Goethe, who has now been deployed to Gaza as part of the Israeli military, is very active on Facebook. We found none of his earlier posts about October 7th saying anything about witnessing a rape. Getter and his family also appear to be monetizing his experience on October 7th in order to sell his fashion line. Um, but the thing to remember here is that the New York Times is claiming a broad pattern of rape as a weapon of war. But these are the only so-called eyewitnesses they managed to produce during their two-month-long investigation. Right. It's not very much. No. And uh, at the Times does say that they talk to rescuers and medics, uh, right? I mean, what about the credibility of their testimonies? Right. Well, one of the key sources for the New York Times articles is actually the Israeli military. You know, the same organization that has slaughtered more than 22,000 people in Gaza over the last three months. And they've also been the gatekeepers for the New York Times, deciding who they can and can't talk to. The New York Times even says in the article that they could only speak to certain people under conditions set by the Israeli military. And you have to only have to imagine the Times taking the Russian military seriously as a source on, say, alleged atrocities by Ukraine. But that's exactly what they do throughout, throughout this article when it comes to the Israeli military, which, as we know, doesn't exactly have the best relationship with the truth. But they also appear to have relied extensively on an organization called Zaka, which the Times describes as a nonprofit emergency response team, which all makes it sound very wholesome and right. credible. But that is very far from the case. What, uh, what do we know about Zaka so far? Our friends at Mondo Wise published some really crucial and well-documented reporting on Zaka on December 30th. They point out that Zaka is a religious uh, Haredi organization specializing in collecting dead bodies and body parts from sites of unnatural deaths and transporting them to morgues according to strict Jewish religious laws. It mm. is extremely controversial, even within Israel. On religious grounds, they oppose 
forensic examinations and autopsies. It was founded in the late 1990s by Yehuda Meshi Zahav, uh, who was previously the leader of Keshet, an ultra-Orthodox Jewish terrorist group that targeted forensic pathologists and used explosives against shops selling secular newspapers. Meshi Zahav led Zaka until 2021 when he attempted uh, suicide after shocking revelations of dozens of rape and sexual assault cases uh, against him. It has also been described by some as a militia. Now, Zaka members have been widely quoted in press reports about October 7th, including this New York Times piece. The Mondo Weiss article points out that the testimonies provided by Zaka's members, all men, most of whom are volunteers, on sexual violence on October 7th, are based on their interpretation of what they claim to have seen on bodies they collected after the attack. Not only do these men lack the professional qualifications to make such assessments, they are not medical experts, but their testimonies also lack details. No age, no location, and no time. Details and or evidence have not been given to journalists who have asked to see them while reporting on these testimonies. This means that it is impossible to either confirm or debunk them. That's from Mondoweiss. Mondoweiss also points out that many of the accounts have been contradictory and inconsistent. Even worse, many of the accounts given by Zaka members since October 7th have proven to be outright fabrications. This includes many of the sensational claims that Hamas fighters tied civilians together and burned them, including children. And on a previous live stream, of course, we debunked that in the case of the claims at Kibbutz Be'eri. It also included the false story of the belly of a pregnant woman being sliced open and the fetus uh, being torn out, a really horrible uh, claim. An investigation by Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, on December 4th tied many of these fabrications directly back to Zaka. For example, here is Yossi Landau, a leader of Zaka, claiming that he saw the, that body of the pregnant woman who had the fetus cut out of her. Let's look at that. It did. But I can tell you, I witnessed myself when I got into the house and I saw that lady on the floor in, a, in, 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 in a blood and I turned her over. I saw her stomach is wide open, ripped open, and a baby, an unborn baby is there stabbed. And she had a gunshot in the back of her head. And so, as you can hear right there, yeah, he's saying he saw it with his own eyes. Mm -hmm. Now, Haaretz says that this exact same story was repeated to them by a member of Zaka who they don't name. It may have been Yossi Landau. Uh, it could have been someone else, but they say a member of Zaka. And that it took place in Kibbutz Be'eri. And here's what Haaretz concludes, and I quote, they got a comment from the Kibbutz about this. Uh, about the the many allegations that were, that were made. And, and here's what they say, again, quoting from Haaretz. The kibbutz adds that the story of the pregnant woman reported by Zaka is not relevant to Be'eri. The police say the case is not known to them, and the pathology source at the Shura army base told Haaretz that he was unaware of the case. And since then, that was uh, on December 4th, that Haaretz article, Nothing has come to light. This was a fabrication. And on October 11th, CBS News reported the following, and I quote, Yossi Landau, the head of operations for the southern region of Zaka, Israel's volunteer civilian emergency response organization, told CBS News he saw with his own eyes children and babies who had been beheaded, end quote. As we all know now, the headed, be, beheaded baby story, which was also repeated by President Joe Biden, is totally fake, a fabrication. And in their response to Haaretz, Zaka said the following, and I quote, the volunteers are not pathology experts and do not have the professional tools to identify a murdered person and his age or declare how he was murdered, end quote. And yet, 
Nora, the New York Times relies on Zaka nice. and the claims of its volunteers, including specifically Yossi Landau, who you just saw lying uh, on that video clip, to interpret that women and girls allegedly found dead were also actually raped. This would be really laughable uh, if it were not just so horrible and yeah. serious what we were dealing with. And I, I want to say also, the Mondo Weiss article details Zaka's ties to the Israeli government and to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who praise it for its role in Israel's post-October 7 public relations campaign, because they say that right. people who are identified as rescuers or first responders have an inherent credibility. Right. So uh, again, another like apolitical humanitarian adjacent group that has absolutely no stake in, you know, fomenting or um, coming up with any of these like absolutely atrocious stories. Um, Ali, what else caught your attention in terms of witness accounts? I, I, I'm using scare quotes like more right. than I've ever used in my life here. <laughs> <laughs> right. The New York Times includes a story provided by a paramedic in an Israeli commando unit who has claimed that he found the bodies of two teenage girls together in a room in Kibbutz Be'eri. This story has been reported by other media over the past couple of months as well. According to the Times, the soldier claimed that one of the girls was lying on her side with boxer shorts ripped, bruises by her groin. The other was sprawled on the floor face down, he said, pajama pants pulled up to her knees, bottom exposed, semen smeared on her back. That's from the Times. Now, the Times admits that they were only allowed to speak to this paramedic with the permission of the Israeli military and without identifying him. Now, in our previous video on this topic, we reported on how this very same story has been debunked. No two girls fitting this description were found together in Kibbutz Berry. No forensic evidence was ever collected, and no photos were taken corroborating this claim. And recall that on December 22nd, the New York Times published its own very lengthy article on Kibbutz Berry, separate from the rape article we're talking about today. That mm. article about Berry makes no mention of two girls being found together in this manner, and it makes no mention of any rapes or sexual assaults in Kibbutz Berry whatsoever. Incredible. Um, you said you want to talk about the evidence the New York Times says does exist. What about that? Right. You might recall that in our previous video, I said there had been a number of articles and reports on Israel's mass rape claims. That includes in Haaretz, the Times of Israel, CNN and the Washington Post, the Sunday Times in the UK and others. And I said that all these stories fit a very distinct pattern. They all start with very sensational and shocking headlines and, claim, and, and then claim systematic rape and atrocities on October 7th. But then over the course of hundreds or sometimes thousands of words, the articles provide excuse after excuse for why there is no forensic evidence, no photographs of crime scenes, and most glaringly of all, no living victims and accusers. Mm -hmm. And this New York Times story fits that pattern exactly. You can just go through it paragraph by paragraph and tick off all the excuses, and they're all the same ones we've seen before. So, for example, they claim that Israel was too busy on October 7th to collect forensic evidence. They claim that Jewish ritual requires the quick burial of bodies, and so that's why there were no autopsies. They claim that the Zaka volunteers have religious restrictions against photographing bodies, so they didn't document any of the crime scenes they allegedly saw. So the effect of all this on the reader is to convey a message that you have to take our word for it because we're the New York Times, and, well, there's no smoke without fire, right? Right. And if you don't believe it, you're a rape apologist, and maybe you're an anti-Semite as right. well. Right, right. It's all really highly manipulative and dishonest, but it's sadly what we've come to expect from the newspaper that shamelessly promoted the uh, Bush administration's lies about weapons of mass destruction, among so many other lies over the decades. Yeah. 
Uh, in our last video, uh, you said that Israel had not identified any living survivors claiming to have been victims of sexual assault or rape on October 7th. Uh, is is that still the case definitively? Does the, the, does the New York Times speak to any? Well, this is the key. The New York Times says that Israeli authorities have still given no number or estimate for how many people were victims of this alleged pattern of rape as a weapon of war. Mm. They also state, and I quote, no survivors have spoken publicly. But there is this intriguing paragraph. Quote, there are at least three women and one man who were sexually assaulted and survived, according to Gil Chorev, a spokesman for Israel's Ministry of Welfare and Social Affairs. None of them has been willing to come physically for treatment, he said. Two therapists said they were working with a woman who was gang raped at the rave and was in no condition to talk to investigators or reporters. So the end quote. So the mm -hmm. only source for the existence of living victims is the government that is committing genocide in Gaza against the people it accuses of the mass rapes. And it says none of them have been willing to come forward physically, which raises doubts as as to whether they even exist. I mean, nobody is saying, even that government person, that uh, anyone has laid eyes on them. Yeah. And while it claims that there was a woman who was gang raped at the rave, the New York Times does not say when this happened or even say that it was done by Hamas or any other Palestinians. These omissions suggest that if this woman exists, she might well have been assaulted prior to the Hamas offensive by other people attending the rave. But remember, the Israelis keep telling us that, A, this was a broad pattern, a campaign of rape as a weapon of war, and B, that we have to believe women. Well, so far, there are still no women to believe because, as the New York Times admits, no one has come forward. They even have this extraordinary quote from the director of the Association of Rape Crisis Centers in Israel, a woman called Arit Solzianu. And she says, many people are looking for, a go for the golden evidence of a woman who will testify about what happened to her. But don't look for that. Don't put this pressure on this woman, Solzianu said. She then claims the corpses tell the story. End quote except that the corpses don't tell the story because no forensic evidence was collected from the corpses, no autopsies were done, and no crime scene photographs were taken. And we've just talked about the quality of the so-called eyewitnesses. So again, what they're saying here is just take our word for it. Mm -hmm. And if you ask too many questions, it means you're a a bad person and a rape apologist who refuses to believe women, and you probably hate Jews too. Exactly. Uh, it, it's often said that rape is, you know, endemic during armed conflicts, uh, that, that it's regularly used as a weapon of war. Why couldn't that be a possibility here? Well, what, one thing to say, Nora, is that, you know, even if they find that there were the, the a victim at some point mm. who and and proof that this victim was attacked that's not the same as saying that there was a pattern of rape and rape as a, a, a weapon of war but they still haven't even credibly shown that but rather than answer you in more depth myself i'm going to refer to craig mukhaiber the mm. un human rights official who resigned over the UN's inaction uh, regarding the genocide in Gaza. Of course, we interviewed him on our own live stream a few weeks ago. But in an interview on the Useful Idiots podcast, uh, also a few weeks ago, he addressed the mass rape claims in detail and also talked about how these things should be investigated. And our friends at Useful Idiots have given us permission to play a couple of minutes of that. And I think it's worth li listening to because Mukhaiber is a human rights defender who worked within the UN system for decades and knows exactly how these things should be done. So let's uh, look, listen to Craig Mukhaiber answering a question from Useful Idiots co-host uh, Katie Halper. 
Israel has accused Hamas of using rape as a weapon on a systemic level, and this is a charge that the media has been picking up, especially CNN and Jake Tapper. In fact, here's Jake Tapper suggesting that the UN is ignoring the allegations and ignoring them because of anti-Semitism. CNN has has led the coverage when it comes to the evidence uh, uh, mounting in Israel of uh, rapes and and sex crimes committed by Hamas against Mm -hmm. women and girls, maybe even against men, uh, on October 7th. Why do you think the United Nations and the international community has been so slow to condemn these atrocities? I I can't think of a a real reason. um, Well, let me just put it this way. I've heard anti-Semitism hypothesized as a reason why the UN and the international community might be uh, so slow to acknowledge this. What's your reaction? Yeah, well, I mean, if you ask me as somebody who's worked in conflict zones and everything for a very long time, I would say that it's entirely possible that some sexual violence occurred on October 7th. And if it did, that's a horrific war crime and any perpetrators have to be held accountable under the rule of uh, law not held accountable by attacking civilian populations or carrying out torture or abusing fighters or anything like that. But if it did, it wouldn't surprise me because it it always happens. It's a common feature of every armed conflict I've ever seen. And indeed, we know Palestinians have been subjected to sexual violence at the hands of the Israelis, starting with the Nakba in 1947 and 48, and then throughout all of the decades since and continuing up until today with reported sexual violence being reported by Palestinian prisoners who've just been released in the, in the prisoner exchange. So we know that that is still going on. So it's entirely possible that someone committed sexual violence on, on October 7th. It's also possible that there wasn't sexual violence on October 7th, because even though it's a constant feature of all uh, situations of armed conflict, October 7th was just a matter of hours, right? It didn't go on for weeks or days that would allow a lot of opportunities for abuses by, uh, by, by soldiers that are so typical uh, of every conflict. Um, so that that's possible as well. The truth is at this stage, we don't know. And what people are being asked to do is to accept as fact allegations being made by the government of Israel. Remember, this is not victims coming forward by the government of Israel, which has engaged in serial fabrication of atrocity claims. So what, what the international community has said, and I agree with, is we need an independent international investigation. This is a serious charge. And if any woman or man was subjected to sexual violence, they have a right uh, to have justice for that. And that means you need an independent international investigation to find out what happened, what didn't happen, right? Uh, by the way, that's another reason why you need a ceasefire, because you need to carry out these kinds of investigations. But Israel has refused an international investigation. It's even refused to cooperate with the standing uh, International Commission of Inquiry that is offered uh, offered to do this. So you can't, on the one hand, say these things have happened and then not allow an investigation to, to discuss using internationally proven methodologies on how to deal with these things, on, on whether they, they have happened. So far, we haven't seen any evidence of, a, I mean, one representation that's coming out of uh, the Israeli government is a charge of a, a campaign of, syst- of, of systematic sexual violence, a widespread campaign of, I mean, anything is possible, but we haven't seen even a hint of evidence that there was a campaign of systematic sexual violence on October 7th. Doesn't mean there was no sexual violence. And again, I will repeat, so people who are cutting out my comments to attack me as a rape denier, <laughs> that any acts of sexual violence should be held accountable under the rule of law. But they haven't allowed an international investigation. I mean, Hmm. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, I I just wanted to say, I think that's a very reasonable and measured view from Craig Mukhaiber. But instead of inviting and assisting an international investigation, Israel is engaging in an international propaganda campaign with the complicity of major media including and especially the New York Times. And I also want to point out that while, as Craig Mukhaiber says, sexual violence is one characteristic of many armed conflicts, so is propaganda. Mm -hmm. Many viewers will recall, for example, that back in 2011, the U.S. State Department under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton claimed that Libyan forces under the command of Colonel Qaddafi were being given Viagra and told to carry out rape on a mass scale. This atrocity story 
was deployed deliberately to convince Americans of the urgent need for U.S. and NATO military intervention to help overthrow Gaddafi. And we all uh, remember seeing the video of Hillary Clinton laughing maniacally after uh, Gaddafi was murdered and, and brutally put on display. Um, later, however, U.S. intelligence officials admitted that there was no evidence for the Viagra and mass rape claims. Representatives of Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and U.N. investigators also said that their organizations were unable to find evidence supporting the claims. But guess who Israel trotted out a couple of weeks ago to market its accusations of mass rape against uh, Hamas? Uh, let's take a look at that. Well, no. Many women and girls were attacked brutally by Hamas on October 7th, and they have testified to the gender-based violence that they both experienced and witnessed. As a global community, we must respond to weaponized sexual violence wherever it happens with absolute condemnation. There can be no justifications and no excuses. Ugh. <laughs> Sorry. Right. No, I, I think that's, that's <laughs> a, a, a gut reaction. Yeah. So uh, as, as we now know, Hillary Clinton is telling another one of her lies when she claims that many women and girls in Israel have, quote, testified to the gender-based violence that they both experienced and witnessed. Mm -hmm. As the Times admits, not a single survivor has come forward and spoken and claimed that they experienced this kind of violence. Right. So what is the takeaway from all of this? I mean, the bottom line here is that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza and is desperate to distract attention from that, as well as to justify its crimes. With public opinion, especially progressive and liberal opinion, turning against it, Israel desperately needs to try to shore up support. And they think this is the perfect narrative to win over progressives and to divide the support base for Palestinian rights. Yeah. The power of the rape claims is that people are reluctant to question them. And that's exactly why we need to be the ones here who go through the claims and the so-called evidence with a fine-tooth comb. Really what they rely on is classic racist and orientalist notions of Palestinians and Arab men as demonic savages who have a predilection for such horrible crimes. Right. And recall that this is that this idea of colonized people as dangerous brutes who attack and rape white and settler women is a very old one. As the Jim Crow Museum observes, the longstanding brute character portrays black men as innately savage, animalistic, destructive, and criminal, deserving punishment and even death. The terrible crime most often mentioned in connection with the black brute was rape, specifically the rape of a white woman. That's from the museum. And they add, at the beginning of the 20th century, much of the virulent anti-black propaganda that found its way into scientific journals, local newspapers, and best-selling novels focused on the stereotype of the black racist. And I think, Nora, this is really just another version of that. Right. Oh, thanks for all of that, Ali. Um, I mean, it just, you know, it, there's also the... What what's happening now that you know there's a, a a video of an interview with Mia Shem, who is one of the captives uh, taken by Palestinian resistance and then released uh, when there was that very you know short period of of a, a truce, um, who said that that basically she 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 said, God, she was saying something like. Um, uh, there was a, a the the guard that was um, watching over her basically raped her her with his eyes, um, and that uh, this was her holocaust. Um, she also describes the you know the evilness of of the children uh, that she met who wouldn't share their candy with her. Just you know like uh, but but basically crying saying that she was 
um, almost, you know, basically raped. Uh, but without being raped. Without being raped. Yeah, she, so, she, yeah, let's just be clear about that. Yeah. At no point does she claim that anyone laid a finger on her in, in, in that sense. Right. And, and that's the case, too. You know, I, I didn't want to... You could have a thousand women who, who, who come out of Gaza or come out of any situation and say, nobody touched me. That right. doesn't take away from the one who might say, you know, who might say that she was and an, who could provide a credible account or if there was evidence. But nobody, nobody is coming out and saying that. I mean, we yeah. saw other women who, who were held in Gaza and then went home saying there was the one woman, uh, Agam and her mother, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't remember their full names, who said, and people saw this clip, that she would arm wrestle with one of the Hamas men, but that he put a towel between their hands so that they that they wouldn't touch physically. And there were right. there are other testimonies like that. So again, it all of this is based on exploiting people's belief mm -hmm. that is uh, inculcated into them, drummed into them by decades of propaganda that Arab men, Muslim men, uh, third world men, black men, because this rape propaganda also was very common in apartheid South Africa, right. that, they, that these men are inherently wild and dangerous and after our women. And this is exactly what this story is relying on. Yeah. And it, I don't think that something so evidence-free and so sensational could pass against almost any other group in this day and age, except perhaps Palestinians. Right. That, at least, at least in the respectable Western press, which is what we've seen. Right. And the New York Times, um, you know, just keeps peddling. Israeli propaganda to, um, to 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 manufacture consent for this ongoing genocide. It is atrocious and and really the the highest level of journalistic malpractice. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like. Leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.